throughout history, societies have evolved as they've used up natural resources. Ed Barbier's new book is called Scarcity and Frontiers, and it looks back over thousands of years at how different cultures reacted as they exploited, say, one resource and then moved on to another. Barbier joined Wyoming Signature's Rennie McKay to talk about the lessons we can learn from the past. Dr. Barbier, uh, the topic you've chosen for this book I I is one that I'm under the impression that uh, is not a popular one. You're, you're venturing into an area where there's not a lot of research. Um, what got you interested in it? Well, what I was doing at the time uh, I started to write this book was exploring uh, the current period of economic development and how natural resources affects development in contemporary economies. And while I was writing that book, um, I decided it would be nice to contrast the current period of development with what happened in past eras, again focusing on natural resources that shaped and influenced development. And so why do you feel like that is an important topic? What can we all glean from it? Well, I think the main message I try and get out of the book is that natural resource scarcity has driven a lot of economic development, both I think currently, but also in the past, and certainly in the past. And what has happened is that uh, economies have responded to natural resource scarcity, not just by conserving natural resources uh, and you know, cutting down demand and so forth, but also by finding new sources, innovating it and uh, applying technologies to new resources. And in doing so, they've actually spurred their development. And those that have been successful, those economies have been successful in, in, in finding new resources and developing new technologies have ended up being the next leaders. Of, of the economies. Did you also find then that the societies that didn't adapt are the ones that have perished? I wouldn't say they perished, but they certainly have faded uh, somewhat in significance. And in some cases, they have disappeared. Uh, for example, if you go back to the beginning of the book where I talk about the agricultural transition, which happened 12,000 years ago, that was the transformation from hunter gathering to, to agricultural societies. And hunter-gatherers haven't disappeared or perished, but they certainly have diminished in importance. Uh, in fact, um, from that period, 12,000 years ago, until the Industrial Revolution in 1750, agricultural societies have dominated the world. How close do you have to be to the end of having access to a resource to be considered scarce? What really matters is not so much the physical loss or the physical depletion or the complete exhaustion of a natural resource, whether it's land or fossil fuels or water, but the fact that the resource becomes sufficiently scarce that, um, that it, it, its value increases. And uh, as a result, it becomes more costly to use. And what happens is if you don't adjust to that cost uh, and respond, uh, then, of course, it becomes a constraint on your economic development. So here we are today, and we're talking about peak oil and, and other scarcity of, of resources. Uh, do you feel like that we are at another situation where we have to start adapting? Yes, but what's really interesting is that, um, as I document in the book, uh, the type of natural resource scarcity problems have changed uh, over the centuries. So, for example, uh, when you had agricultural-based societies, land was the primary natural resource, and land was important for agriculture as it was important for the source of energy. For example, biofuels, wood, was the primary source of energy, uh, and charcoal based on wood. The Industrial Revolution was, in a sense, a response to that scarcity, and we discovered and utilized fossil fuels, starting first with coal in the 18th century, and then eventually, of course, with the discovery of oil in the United States, um, oil became the predominant, and, and then natural gas. Uh, now, of course, we're, we're faced with a, a completely different set of scarcities. Yeah, there's the problem of peak oil and the concern of the depletion of fossil fuels, but I would argue, as I do in the book, that we have uh, two other really important types of environmental scarcities or ecological scarcities. One is the deterioration of ecosystems and all the goods and services they provide us from fresh water to uh, natural habitats to uh, uh, soil erosion uh, to good quality air and water. So ecosystems are disappearing, and also we are facing global climate change. Um, the, the capacity of the Earth to stabilize our climate is clearly deteriorating. 
And uh, these are phenomenal scarcity problems, and we have to, again, five, find ways of using natural resources differently, perhaps finding new sources of natural resources, such as uh, low carbon technologies and technologies that put less pressure on, on the environment and ecosystems. And the economies that innovate and do that are going to be the next generation of world leaders. Does that mean that Wyoming's economy, this one state in this one country, needs to do that? Or, or uh, are you referring more to the entire globe and changes that would happen at that level? I think change has to happen at all levels. Uh, and Wyoming is, of course, right in the center of it all because uh, if you take the United States, Wyoming is one of the major producers of fossil fuels. And also in Wyoming, we also have the opportunity to innovate and explore new uses of fossil fuels. Uh, we're not going to end our dependence on fossil fuels overnight, but as fossil fuels become more expensive, we have to learn to use them more wisely, imply new technologies to use them, and also um, the new technologies that use the fossil fuels but get rid of the bad stuff such as the carbon and sulfur dioxide and other pollutant byproducts. So in this uh, uh, economy, in Wyoming, we've got opportunities to do things such as use carbon dioxide to enhance oil recovery. That is, put carbon dioxide into old oil reserves and get out more oil from the, uh, the old oil reservoirs. We also have opportunities to um, develop carbon sequestration technologies. We have um, the chance to uh, uh, develop, uh, uh, if we move to power generation in this economy, which has been a push in the last few years, we have the opportunity to develop the newest technologies that, that take out the sulfur as well as, again, uh, remove the carbon and then store the carbon. Uh, and then in Wyoming, we can also, through our uh, geology, uh, become a source of geological carbon storage which is going to be an important technology for controlling carbon dioxide emissions. So there's a lot of opportunities here in Wyoming. What it means is innovating and using our resources differently than perhaps we did it 10, 15, 20 years ago, or even today. Carbon sequestration and, and all of the things that you mentioned are projects that are underway. There, there's development here to, right. to, to start down those roads. Do you think that, that Wyoming's doing well at moving into this new economy? I think that, uh, well, I think Wyoming is, is, is certainly involved in leading uh, in the United States some of this work because I think there's been recognition in this state that we can't, we, the state of Wyoming, can't go on just simply depleting uh, fossil fuels, selling them on the market, and banking the, pro the, the profits uh, or the returns. We need to, 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 to think about our future as an economy and how we're going to sustain development in the economy, and that's through innovation. And, uh, and developing new industries and using the same resources but in more industrious ways. And similarly, we, we, we do the same thing with our other important natural resource, which is the environment. Uh, we have to think of new ways of using our national parks and our state parks and our uh, resources that we set aside for recreation and also for forests. Uh, uh, how do we want to use them? How do we manage them? How do we deal with problems such as um, beetle kill? And how do we uh, manage uh, the influx of tourism that comes to Wyoming to see our natural resources and our beautiful environment? And how do we sustain and develop that in a way that doesn't damage our ecosystems? Same with our water. How do we manage our water in conjunction with our uh, neighboring states so that uh, uh, we, we uh, conserve the water resource, but at the same time, we use it for the best purposes in the future? All right, great. Dr. Ed Barbier, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Rennie. Barbier has consulted for a variety of national and international as well as non-governmental agencies, including the World Bank.